Hi, I'm Bill Selov. I'm a third year pathology resident. And I'd like to talk to you about large cells and lymph nodes. There are a number of conditions in which we see normal lymph node architecture in great part effaced by sheets of large cells. These conditions can range from reactive conditions like infectious mononucleosis to high-grade lymphomas like anaplastic large cell lymphoma and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. What I'd like to do here is to help teach you to distinguish among these entities using various morphologic and immunohistochemical clues. Before we uh, talk about specific diseases though, let's review normal lymph node morphology and physiology, paying particular attention to where we would normally expect to see large cells in lymph nodes. Now a lymph node is essentially comprised of two fairly discrete compartments. There's the lymphoid compartment made up of the cortical B cell area, paracortical T cell area, and medullary cords with plasma cells. And then there's the sinus compartment, what we see in pink here, wrapping around these lymphoid areas. And the sinus compartment has the job of uh, receiving and filtering the lymph so that it's clean when it re-enters the blood. The main cells doing this cleaning are the macrophages. And macrophages are our first big cell that we're going to talk about in the lymph node. Macrophages are considered large cells because they have a nucleus that is greater than or equal to twice the size of a mature lymphocyte nucleus. That's sort of how we'll define large cell here. Here's a lymphocyte. We see that it's got a, you know, a relatively small nucleus, and then we compare the macrophage nucleus to it over twice the size. We'll also notice that the macrophage nucleus, like other large cells, has more open chromatin versus the tight, compact, dark chromatin that we see in the lymphocyte. We'll also note that the cytoplasm of macrophages is ample, and it's pink and it's bubbly. The reason for this bubbly appearance of the macrophage cytoplasm is that macrophages have vacuoles in them in which they're processing debris that they've picked up. Macrophages are essentially the working class heroes of the lymph node. The, uh, the garbage men, the blue collar workers who do the essential work of cleaning up the lymph node. They do this uh, with the aid of various receptors like uh, complement receptors and FC receptors and scavenger receptors. Scavenger receptors that they have include CD68, which is a useful immunohistochemical marker for them. In this way, macrophages are able to clear the lymph of all the various sorts of pathogens and dead cells and debris so that the blood uh, is clean, that the, the lymph entering the blood is clean. Macrophages also do play uh, a role in antigen presentation, particularly in the subcapsular sinus, but the predominant task of macrophages is garbage cleanup. Now you'll note, uh, as I said, the, uh, the lymphoid compartment and sinus compartment are fairly discreet. It's sort of as though uh, lymphocytes don't like to deal with common macrophages and lymph and so forth. They're sort of like highfalutin folk uh, that think that they're too good to deal with uh, common innate immune cells like macrophages. The only innate immune cells that lymphocytes seem to deal with in the lymphoid compartment are cells that directly serve them. Cells like tingible body macrophages and follicular dendritic cells in the germinal centers and cells like interdigitating dendritic cells in the paracortex. Let's uh, take a look at some of these supporting cells next. First, let's take a look at the interdigitating dendritic cell. This is our second large cell of the lymph node. The interdigitating dendritic cell, like the macrophage, uh, begins life as a, uh, as a monocyte. But as opposed to differentiating in the direction of phagocytosis and cleanup like macrophages, 
interdigitating dendritic cells uh, differentiate in the direction of antigen presentation. At first, they're out in uh, peripheral tissues, they're, they're out uh, under the skin and in the oral mucosa and in the uh, gut mucosa and lungs and so forth. And they're serving a job as sentinels. They're out monitoring their environment, looking for anything amiss. As they do this, they, uh, they sample their environment with macropenocytosis and phagocytosis, looking uh, for particular patterns known as pathogen-associated molecular patterns in the material that they're sampling. Like a good uh, veteran beat cop, they don't know particularly who a bad guy is if they see him, but they can recognize that he is a bad guy. Now, if a dendritic cell picks up uh, a recognize, if it picks up a pathogen that it recognizes as being a pathogen, then it goes on the alert. It breaks free from its stroma and surrounding cells and swims into the lymph to broadcast the warning that there are pathogens here. It swims in the lymph over toward the nearest lymph node. Then it burrows its way into the lymphoid compartment, specifically into the paracortex. There in the paracortex, it extends its long cytoplasmic processes, expresses its MHC molecules with processed antigen, and it also has unprocessed antigen that it presents. And it's, uh, and it sends out an alert. Now these uh, interdigitating dendritic cells uh, often aren't very visible in a lymph node, but under some reactive conditions, particularly conditions like dermatopathic lymphadenopathy, they can be uh, quite prominent. Uh, they can have large nuclei, sometimes dual nuclei, and they have ample pink cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm with their long cytoplasmic processes stains positive for fashion, which uh, supports their extensive cytoskeletal networks. Now these interdigitating dendritic cells, after they establish themselves in the, in the uh, paracortex, they express cytokines and chemokines saying, the pathogens are coming, the pathogens are coming. These cytokines and chemokines spread throughout the paracortex. Some cytokines find their way over to high endothelial venules, and this activates the high endothelial venules. High endothelial venules then become our third large cell of the lymph node. When activated, the high endothelial venules massively plump up. Their nucleus expands and they uh, also develop uh, much more ample cytoplasm. And these high endothelial venules can have a rather alarming appearance to the untrained eye. But careful examination will always reveal a, uh, a clear vessel forming pattern that gives them away as uh, high endothelial venules. These high endothelial venules, in addition to their morphologic changes, also change their expression of adhesion molecules. They start expressing many more uh, ICAM-1 and VCAM adhesion molecules, and this attracts more lymphocytes into the lymph node. Incidentally, lymphocytes seem to love entering a lymph node through high endothelial venules, sort of like their executive entrance directly into the lymphoid compartment instead of having to deal with the common lymph and macrophages in the uh, afferent ducts. So, you might imagine first a T cell grasping onto the adhesion molecules on the high endothelial venule and swooping into the lymphoid compartment with an, uh, an aristocratic kind of flourish saying, here I am, uh, how can I save the day? Then the uh, T cell will follow the chemokine trail over to the interdigitating dendritic cell that broadcasts the alert. Once it gets there, uh, if it happens to have affinity for the same antigen that the interdigitating dendritic cell is expressing, then the interdigitating dendritic cell activates that T cell and the T cell becomes a T cell 
immunoblast. It starts proliferating. It undergoes some drastic changes. Its nucleus grows to three or four times its former size. Its chromatin opens up and clears out as it synthesizes new DNA to pass on to its progeny. It develops a large central nucleolus to crank out ribosomes uh, in order to make proteins. And its cytoplasm massively expands uh, and turns amphiphilic to blue, stuffed with messenger RNA transcripts for its ribosomes to read. Now these immunoblasts, they can be uh, CD4 immunoblasts or CD8 immunoblasts uh, as appropriate according to the antigen expressed. But it's not just T cells that are drawn to the signal from the interdigitating dendritic cells. Also, B cells will cling to the uh, uh, adhesion molecules on high endothelial venules come into the lymph node. When a B cell enters a lymph node, it hears two different messages. First, it hears the call of CXCL13, the call home toward the B cell area of the lymph node, the cortex. But it also hears the call of adventure, CCL19 and CCL21, drawing it toward the, uh, the action with the activated interdigitating dendritic cell. So the B cell will end up steering a course around these activated interdigitating dendritic cells, this naive B cell sort of peeking like a kid, curious about what's going on. And if it happens to have affinity for the same antigen being expressed by the interdigitating dendritic cell, then it will find right there, still in the arms of the interdigitating dendritic cell, its cognate helper T cell. And that helper T cell will activate the B cell right there in the paracortex, making the B cell uh, form a primary focus, uh, becoming a B cell immunoblast. So a B cell immunoblast will look just like the T cell immunoblast we talked about, only it'll stain positive for B cell lineage markers like CD19 and CD20. Now, after this B cell proliferates in this primary focus, its progeny can take one of two career tracks. One th for one, they can choose to uh, go straight to work as plasma cells, and go into the medullary cords and start, their, uh, start, their, start to work. The other choice that they can make is to go to Germinal Center College learn their antigen better before becoming plasma cells. Let me tell you something. If I already gave you the impression that lymphocytes in general are full of themselves, you should see these B cells that are admitted to Germinal Center College. These B cells march up to the middle of a primary follicle they're uh, admiring helper T cells in tow. They plop themselves down in the middle of the primary follicle, push all their naive B cell fellows aside, and then they just start showing off. They turn themselves in to our fifth large cell of the lymph node, the centroblast. They swell up their nuclei to three, four, five times the normal size, and they push all their chromatin off to the rim. Then they decorate this chromatin with not just one, but multiple nucleoli, like a big, gaudy pearl necklace. That's not all. These cells also, just to show how special they are, it seems, start expressing CD10, like a designer label, to set themselves apart from the naive B cells in the mantle. They also start expressing BCL6, which allows them uh, to proliferate, but blocks differentiation. But it's not all fun and games in the germinal center. Not all fun and games and vanity. No, there's work to be done. These B cells have the specific job of learning their antigen better. So like it or not, they have to get to work studying. Unfortunately, 
cells are lousy students. So their means of studying to learn their antigen better is by randomly mutating their variable portions of their B cell receptors in hopes that they might accidentally come on some combination that gives them better affinity. After a round of uh, proliferation, it's exam time in the germinal center. And the B cells uh, convert to a, a, a centrocyte kind of conformation. Their, their nucleus shrinks down, their uh, chromatin clumps together, and they end up having a clefted form and start expressing their B cell receptors that they've been working on. And the exam proctor in the germinal center, the cell that is administering the exam is the follicular dendritic cell. And that is the next large cell of the lymph node that we'll talk about. The follicular dendritic cell is a lot like the interdigitating dendritic cell in the way that it appears. It's uh, like the interdigitating dendritic cell. It's got big uh, nuclei, sometimes dual nuclei. It has ample pink cytoplasm, extensive uh, cytoplasmic processes. Unlike the interdigitating dendritic cell, though, the follicular dendritic cell is not of monocyte origin. In fact, it's not even of hematopoietic origin at all. It's got some nebulous mesenchymal origin. And also, unlike interdigitating dendritic cells, these cells don't express antigen on MHC molecules. Instead, they, uh, they present unprocessed antigen in immune complexes that they hold on to via CD receptors like CD21 and CD35 and via FC receptors like CD23. Here's, a, here's just a, a follicular dendritic cell with lots of B cells around it. Here's staining for CD23 that uh, highlights the extensive cytoplasmic processes of follicular dendritic cells uh, studded with CD23 FC receptors. Now, these follicular dendritic cells uh, are, as I said, presenting antigen in immune complexes on their complement receptors and FC receptors. And these B cells that have just gone to work uh, trying to study their antigen by mutating their B cell receptors. Now they go to work trying to attach to the antigen presented by these follicular dendritic cells. If the B cells happen to have improved affinity for their antigen, then they are lauded with praise. The follicular dendritic cells pat their B cell receptors and say, oh, you are such a pretty, smart B cell and follicular helper T cells also shower them with praise with uh, cytokines like interleukin-4 and with uh, CD40, CD40 ligand interactions saying, oh, indeed, you are the fairest and cleverest B cell of them all. And B cells uh, just flourish with the attention from the follicular dendritic cells and helper T cells. And they go on to further rounds of proliferation or uh, they differentiate into plasma cells. But if, on the other hand, the B cell fails to show improved affinity for its antigen, then the follicular dendritic cells turn their backs on the B cells. The follicular helper T cells turn their backs on the B cells. And the B cell, left all alone without external validation from the follicular dendritic cells and follicular helper T cells, withers and dies. The reason that the germinal center B cell dies is because for all its gain with its uh, CD10 and BCL6, it's given up something very important. It's given up BCL2. BCL2 is a lot like self-confidence. It's what allows a normal, naive B cell to go on surviving without external survival signals from the cells around it. Germinal center B cells, having given up BCL2, are exquisitely sensitive to apoptosis, 
without constant uh, externally derived validation and reassurance, they die. They become apoptotic. And that's what necessitates the unfortunate presence of our seventh large cell of the lymph node, the tingible body macrophage, the undertaker of the germinal center. These cells have the morbid job of consuming the bodies of the B cell suicides, the apoptotic B cells. But let's not dwell on this unpleasant topic anymore. If a B cell does happen to uh, survive the gauntlet of somatic hypermutation and affinity maturation, then it gets to graduate from Germinal Center College. It gets awarded its MUM1 diploma that allows it to differentiate into a plasma cell. So it leaves the Germinal Center, throws its hat in the air with one last uh, celebratory burst of proliferation as a post-germinal center B-cell immunoblast, and then differentiates into a plasma cell. So this uh, basically covers the normal morphology and physiology of, uh, of lymph nodes. Now I'd like to just briefly review the large cells we've talked about. First, in the sinus area, we have macrophages. Macrophages, of course, have big nuclei like all these large cells. They have ample cytoplasm that's pink and bubbly, with lots of vacuoles. And uh, macrophages are going to stain positive for the CD68 scavenger receptor. It's useful for marking macrophages. Moving into the paracortex, we have interdigitating dendritic cells which have extensive uh, pink cytoplasmic processes. They have large cells, uh, or large nuclei rather, sometimes two nuclei, and their processes are going to stain positive for fashion. Also in the paracortex, we have high endothelial venules, which when activated can have very big nuclei and lots of cytoplasm. They can look scary, but they're easily recognizable by their clear vessel forming uh, patterns. Then also in the paracortex, we have immunoblasts with uh, lots of basophilic cytoplasm, big nuclei, very large central nucleoli, and these might be uh, CD4 or CD8 T cell immunoblasts, or they might be pre or post germinal center B cell immunoblasts all in the paracortex. Now moving into the germinal center, we have the B cell immunoblasts, the college students with their big gaudy pearl necklaces and their CD10 and BCL6 positivity, but lacking the essential BCL2 self-confidence protein. Then we have the follicular dendritic cell exam proctors uh, that present antigen uh, via complement receptors like CD21 and CD35 and via FC receptors like CD23. And they are presenting antigen to the B cells. And then finally, we have tingible body macrophages that consume the bodies of the B cell suicides from the germinal center B cells that don't make it. So this concludes our review of lymph node morphology and physiology. In the next video, I'm going to discuss specific disease entities, uh, reactive conditions like Kikuchi, Kikuchi's lymphadenitis and infectious mononucleosis. We'll talk about uh, lymphomas, uh, high-grade lymphomas like anaplastic large cell lymphoma and uh, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We'll also discuss other entities like myeloid sarcoma. We'll discuss a large number of entities that are characterized by diffuse proliferations of large cells. We'll talk about how to leverage apart the identities of these various entities using features like localization within the lymph node, uh, context of bystander cells, and immunohistochemistry. I hope you'll join us. Thank you.